Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode here on 0612 TV. Today, we're talking about storing passwords, and we're going to try and approach this as quickly and pictorially as possible. We'll be looking at some fairly common technical terms like cryptographic hashing. We'll be discussing some of the pros and cons of the techniques used, including common exploits like rainbow tables. And you'll hear me mention terms like salting. So these are some of the key things I wanted to cover in today's video. So without further ado, let us jump right in. First and foremost, why do we bother storing passwords? Let's say you're running some kind of online service. Of course, you want your users to be able to log in, and how they log in is by supplying a password. That password gets sent to your server, and what your server does is, it will have to look at the entered password, compare it with the version you have saved, and check to see if it matches or not. Of course, if it does match, that means, yeah, this is who they claim to be, right? And you allow their login to go through. That's why we need to store passwords. We have to do this to authenticate our users. So then we can move on to the question of how. How do we store our passwords? Of course, the easiest and the most naive way is to, well, just store them, right? Store them exactly as they are. This, of course, will work perfectly for authentication purposes. If the user gives their password, you can just, well, check it directly against your database. If it matches, all is well. Of course, this is in a case of day-to-day -day use. In this context, everything is fine. But what if somebody with a slightly more malicious intent comes along? If they steal your database, well, that's trouble with a capital T, because all the passwords are just lying there in plain view. Not only will they have access to basically anyone's account on your machine, don't forget, people have the tendency to reuse passwords. That same password may compromise more than whatever is just on your machine. This may also affect other services in which your user has signed up to, from things like social media to email, and even worse, to things like banking. But actually, the worst thing here is the email. And the reason for that is, if they can somehow figure out the email of your user and somehow figure out their other accounts, they can start sending forgot password emails to that email account, which again makes it easier for them to, yeah, basically gain access to things they shouldn't have access to. So yeah, basically this is a can of worms, long story short, don't do this. Never ever store passwords in plain text. So what is the alternative? What is a safer way of storing your user's information? Remember, you need to do this in order to authenticate your users. Clearly, we have to store the information, but protect it in a certain way. Perhaps what we can do is we can grab the password and convert it somehow so that the original form isn't there anymore. This is indeed what is done with storing passwords. People sometimes mistakenly call this encryption, but this isn't actually encryption. You see, encryption refers to taking something, right, which we'll call plain text again, and by putting it through an algorithm, generate what is essentially a garbled mess called cipher text. The cipher text looks like nothing meaningful to the naked eye, but if you enter the correct key or password, you are able to decrypt it back to the original plain text. This is encryption, and this is not what is done for passwords. Instead, a different procedure called hashing takes place. It is conceptually not that different. We have our plain text, and we put it through a hashing algorithm to get something that is, again, a garbled mess. In the context of hashing, we will call this, well, a hash. The key difference between encryption and hashing is that you cannot reverse this process. Hashing is a destructive process. You can only go one way from the plain text to get the hash, but you cannot recover the original plain text from the hash itself. Hashing is essentially the technique we use to protect our passwords. In fact, coming back to the context of security, the hashing techniques used are called cryptographic hashes. Essentially, cryptographic hashing methods 
take more precautions to ensure that your information is being hashed in a way that is more secure. Some examples of this could include having small changes in the inputs creating very large changes in the output hash. It can also involve basically avoiding collisions, which are instances of when multiple things hash to the same value. And that is why in order to store your passwords, cryptographic hashing is used. It is especially favored in this context because it is impossible to recover the original password out of the hash, which of course gives us an even greater level of confidentiality. So in your server, instead of storing passwords, you would store their hashed versions instead. So how does authentication work now? When a user comes along, they provide you with their password. Well, essentially, the steps are the same. You grab the user's password, and you hash it first. This produces a hash, which you can then check against whatever you have in your database. Again, if these two things match, then your user will be allowed to log in. Thanks to the nature of cryptographic hashes, it is no longer as much of a problem if someone comes along and steals your entire database. Sure, they will see all the hashed values, but if they try to provide the hash as a password, that's not going to work because the authentication system hashes that password. What you've entered isn't going to be taken verbatim. Of course, what you get at the end of the day will not match what is stored in the database because the hash has been hashed again. And therefore, this isn't going to allow the attacker access to your machine and it will also not give them any way of figuring out what the original password is. They're basically quite stuck. Of course, there are certain limitations to all this. Now, our hash function needs to be deterministic. What this means is, if you put in something, it will always give you the same result. This of course is necessary for everything we've described up to this point to work correctly. This could pose a problem in certain contexts. For example, some passwords are more common than others. Password, for example, is a very common one. What this means is, if multiple people use the same password, their passwords are going to all be hashed the same in the database, and this could pose some problems. The attacker could formulate some kind of strategy out of this. For example, if they wanted to target people who had very common passwords, what your attacker could do is to get a list of the most common passwords, which is something you could easily find online, and put them one by one through the hash function. Generally, the hash functions that are used are not secret, and what this means is your attacker could potentially run this process on their own computer. As a result of this, they would generate a list of all of common hashes, which come from common passwords. Assuming that they have also compromised your server, what they can then do is to simply match the two. With the credentials stolen from the server, as well as a list of common hashes computed by the hacker, they could simply go line by line and see if there are any hashes they recognize. For example, we've got one right here. This could clue you into the fact that this particular user is using this particular password. So this isn't great, and this particular attack is called a lookup table attack. By pre-computing hashes, your attacker could look up and potentially still figure out what the passwords were. That's of course not to say that cryptographic hashing is then completely useless. This is still infinitely better than storing plain text passwords because it involves a lot more effort on the part of the attacker. However, as we can see here, some flaws still exist. Your attacker could take this a step further by creating a very large table of, say, every possible hash out of every possible password. Of course, some problems with this is that this table gets extremely large, we're talking gigabytes or even terabytes in size, which is why generally attackers don't use a lookup table directly. Instead, using a lookup table, they could construct what is known as a rainbow table. A rainbow table is a re-representation of the contents within a lookup table, but set up in such a way that, instead of having to have every possible password and hash listed out, only a small number of hashes and plain texts are being stored. However, the remaining ones can be computed using the ones that are, well, actually present within the rainbow table itself. 
So not only have attackers found their way around, you know, a basic use of cryptographic hashing, they've even found an efficient way to represent and manipulate that information. So that is not great. Of course, despite this, it is important to note that they haven't cracked hashing. What this means is hashing is still strictly a one-way process. There is no notion of deriving plain text passwords directly back from the hashes, right? We're not doing an inverse of the hash function. It is not really possible, at least at our current level of knowledge. So that's not what's happening. A rainbow table is still a fancy incarnation of a lookup table. However, since this process has become efficient, it is still a valid concern. Going back to the root cause of this problem, remember that the whole issue here is recognizable hashes. Whether it's because they're all derived from a common password, or whether if it's just hash values generated out of shorter passwords by brute force, either way, the key issue here is that the hashes are recognizable. So what we can do is we can tweak up the passwords a little bit, perhaps by appending a little bit of stuff at the back of it. Of course, remember a property of our hash functions, even a small change in the original information is going to create a vastly different hash at the end of the day. And as you can see, we now end up with, yeah, completely different and unique looking hashes. This is in fact what is done. And this little extra thing we've sprinkled on at the end of our passwords are called salts. Here's how salts work. Salts are randomly generated strings of text for each user. Each user has their own unique salt. And as it turns out, we can just store them in plain text on our database. Again, the authentication process is basically the same. Your user comes along, they supply their password. And what we do is before we perform hashing, we need to join the two things together whatever password they've entered, and whatever salt belongs to their user ID. The whole thing is then put through our hashing function. The result, again, is matched to see whether, well, that's the right person or not. And if everything matches up nicely, they'll be allowed to log in. So not much difference with the authentication aspect. But of course, the question is, is it secure? Interestingly, we can have our sorts stored in plain text like this, even if our hacker comes along and steals it all. In order to understand this, we must first understand why rainbow tables are so effective in the first place. If we have a stolen table of unsalted hashes, what we can then do is we can use a single rainbow table and basically try and figure out all the passwords. Since a rainbow table is pre-computed, this could be a fairly fast process. All the hard work has already been put in during the construction of the rainbow table. Its computational cost when actually put in use is negligible. However, things are different when we sort our passwords. Now, the sorted hashes here represent things that are too complicated for our rainbow table. Even if it was a simple password, it is now combined with a complex sort to create a complex plain text to start off with. And what this means is a rainbow table or lookup table probably doesn't have the correct entry to figure out what password this is. Of course, since our attacker has the salt, they could still attempt to figure it out. They could still take all the common passwords, they could you know, append it to the salt and basically try and generate all the hashes based on that one particular salt. But now that is a lot of work because essentially, you have to build one rainbow table for each user. Each one of these tables cannot be reused because every user has their own salt. And because of this, every user has their own set of potential password hashes. What this means is this is extremely computationally expensive for the attacker. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why passwords are stored with cryptographic hashing and salt. Using these two methods together, even if your entire database has been compromised, well, not a lot is going to happen. Your attacker will not be able to efficiently recover the original plain text passwords. And that's why these methods are used. Of course, more can be done to make passwords even more secure. For example, certain methods involve using a hash function, not once, 
but multiple times, potentially thousands of times. After combining the password and the salt, the two things are hashed, the result is hashed again and again and again and again. The purpose of this is to make things computationally expensive for the attacker. When it's just one person logging in, well, we've got to do 1000 steps here, but that's it, and this can be done fairly quickly. However, for an attacker, because they are guessing at potential passwords, they're going to have to do this entire process many times over, and that is where this step adds up. This is where things become really computationally expensive for your attacker. Of course, at the end of the day, this process will produce a hash. And again, that is what is stored, that is what is used for authenticating the user. So yeah, essentially, that's it. That's all there is for this episode about storing passwords. Hopefully this has been insightful, and hopefully this has cleared up some misconceptions and terminologies associated with the steps involved in this process. That's all there is for this particular episode. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.